Gail McGovern, and I have the extraordinary privilege and honor to be the president and CEO of the American Red Cross. And from this position, I give a lot of public speeches. I talk about leadership. I talk about transformation. I talk about leading a nonprofit. And of course, as you would suspect, I talk to lots of groups of people about our mission. But today, I'm going to be talking about something very personal. And it actually makes me uncomfortable. It makes me a little emotional. And it also makes me nervous. And that is my journey with breast cancer. So you're probably wondering why that makes me feel so uncomfortable. Well, I hate appearing vulnerable. I like looking strong. I like looking like I'm in control. I hate playing the role of the damsel in distress. And in fact, I prefer to dispense help rather than ask for it. But when the TED Med folks asked me if I would talk about this topic, I figured if there's just one person that gets a single nugget out of what I'm talking about, then it will have been worth it for me to put myself on the line like this. So they say that one in eight women in the US are going to be diagnosed with breast cancer. But I think what makes my situation unique is that I actually had breast cancer twice, and I elected to go through it in two very different ways. The first time, I kept it very, very private, and the second time, it was extremely public. Now, I want to tell you, I feel great, I'm fit, I go to the gym six days a week, I've had clean films on my left side for six years. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. And I've had clean films on my right side for two years. But um, see, even now, I don't want to seem like the damsel in distress. I want you to know that I'm feeling great. So in any event, the first time I was diagnosed, I was actually teaching marketing at the Harvard Business School. And the timing was such that I just finished up in the classroom, so I was able to get my treatment during the semesters. And it was during the break, so none of my 360 students that were wandering around campus had a clue. I still did office hours, I was sponsoring field trips, I was dispensing career planning advice, and none of them knew. I told a few members of the faculty, I told the dean of the business school, I told close family and close friends, and that was it. And I noticed among the group of people that I had shared this with, a certain awkwardness. I call it cancer eyes. It's the look people get in their face when they have a chance encounter with you, and they actually look frightened. They're thinking, I don't know what to say. Should I ask her if she's OK? Should I ignore the topic completely? If anything, it reinforced my decision to keep this all private. And I have to say, it made me think I was brave. And if I'm honest with myself, it made me feel a little smug. Somebody would say to me, oh, I have the worst head cold. And I would think, oh, you big baby. <laughs> if you only knew what I was going through, you wouldn't be complaining about that cold. And if I'm really honest with myself, I think part of the reason I kept it so private is I was in a bit of denial. I think I thought if no one knew I had cancer, then it really couldn't have been all that bad. So the second time I was diagnosed with breast cancer, it was two years after I joined the American Red Cross. And as luck would have it, or as bad luck would have it, I learned about my diagnosis the day after the horrific earthquake struck Haiti. And I was feeling pretty sorry for myself. I couldn't believe I had to go through this again. I couldn't believe I was putting my family through it again. So after reeling, I was just absolutely reeling, I got on an airplane and I went back up to Boston and visited the team of doctors from my first bout with cancer at Mass General Hospital. I met with a breast surgeon, with an oncologist, with a radiation oncologist. Then I came back to DC where I live and I knew I was gonna have to be treated locally so I got three more opinions from three specialists at Johns Hopkins University. And then I went to Haiti. Haiti is a country where only one in 10,000 people will ever see a doctor in their entire life. Where only 30% of the people in that country have access to clean drinking water or latrines. 
where only 25% of the people in that country even have electricity. And I got there right after the earthquake, and what I saw was absolutely staggering. This was a poor country, as I described before the earthquake. After the earthquake, there were millions of people just staggering around in silence. They were in shock. It was like a zombie movie. And their injuries were indescribable. Missing limbs, people walking with sticks, head injuries with makeshift bandages on their heads. The deceased weren't even buried. And in fact, they were strewn in the streets. And I came home and I told my husband, I just snapped my fingers and I had arguably six of the greatest doctors in our country giving me opinions about my breast cancer. That when I take a single shower, more potable drinking water is pouring down my drain than most Haitians will see in a lifetime. And so I told my husband, if I complain about this cancer for one second, I want you to hit me upside the head. So I said, I'm going to march through this just like I did the last time. I'm going to just tell a few people. I'm going to keep it private. I'm going to get my treatment, and I'm going to be done with it. And that was my plan, but it didn't work out that way. First, I went to the office, and I figured I'd just tell my senior team. And the first person that I told was Susie DeFrancis, who is our chief public affairs office, officer at the American Red Cross. And she said, Gail, there's just no way you can keep this private. She said, you have six weeks of treatment right in the middle of when you have six weeks of travel. You're visiting donors, you're visiting chapters, you're giving speeching engagements. And I said, no, 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 I cannot go public with this. And she said, the rumors are going to be so intense, it's going to be worse than reality. Going public was my worst nightmare. And to understand what happened next, you need to understand a little bit about the American Red Cross. First of all, everything that we do is because the generosity of the American public. So our supporters are heartfelt, generous, caring, comforting. We deliver about 40% of the nation's blood supply. Every year, we're shipping between six and eight million units of blood. And each one of them was donated by somebody so generous that they would open up their veins to save the life of a total stranger. We respond to 70,000 disasters every year. You might see us on TV, those are maybe one half of 1% of the disasters. In fact, right here in the District of Columbia, we average nine disasters every single week, most of which are single family house fires. And we give people a blanket, comfort, hope, a hug, place to sleep, clothing, shelter. It's really quite remarkable, the compassion that we demonstrate. And the other thing that we do is we help the men and women in the armed forces. And each year we connect about 300,000 emergency connections. And these are between the men and women that serve and their families. So this could be something as simple as uh, a soldier who is in Afghanistan where one of our volunteers sets up a Skype connection so he can teach his teenage son how to shave for the first time or a woman who is serving in Iraq, who we get to the foot of her grandfather's bed in time for her to see him before he passes away. We do all of this with 30,000 employees and 650,000 volunteers. It's extraordinary. And the typical Red Crosser is caring, compassionate, nurturing. And Susie looked at me and said, Gail, you've got to give your Red Cross family the opportunity to wrap you in a blanket of love. And when she said that, I literally felt like I was smothering. I thought, I just, I can't do this. And she said to me, let them help you. And that was my big aha moment, because helping is such an innate human need. We all have it. You know, we all want to give back. We all want to help. And asking for help is giving a person a gift, a gift to be able to give back. So, and, and by the way, all of you in the healthcare ind industry and all of you in the medical industry, that's probably why you pursued your career. I know it's why I joined the American Red Cross. 
So with great trepidation, I sent a letter to all of our volunteers and our employees, and we put out a press release. And what happened next was astounding. I got letters telling me people's personal stories. I got holy water from lords. I got mass cards. I got um, a, rosary beads. And by the way, I'm not even Catholic. <laughs> I got a Koran. I got blessings from a rabbi. I am Jewish. I was relieved when he called me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I actually got a call on Sunday at my home from President Obama. I was stunned. He told me that he and the First Lady were rooting for me to get better because they cared deeply for me and the American Red Cross is so important to our country. What an act of generosity. I think he has a lot on his calendar and taking time out to do that was incredible. For me personally, I got the opportunity to experience the Red Cross the way the people that we serve experience the Red Cross. I got to be nurtured, I got to be comforted. And I dare say as a result of that, I was a better person. I know I was a better leader because before I was leading a lot with my head, but after this experience, I was also leading with my heart. So for those of you in the healthcare industry, there were two gifts that my wonderful doctors gave me. And I want to share that with you because I believe that it might be something that you would consider to also share with your patients. So they were willing to discuss the spectrum with me of being very, very private to very, very public. And they helped me walk through it. They helped me figure out, did I actually want to do this? Two of them worked with me to sign the, help me do the press release. And this was such a special thing for me because you don't really understand the implications. They kept checking in to see if my support network was okay. Now you may be thinking, well, that's a unique situation. You know, I'm in a fairly public role, so this is only gonna happen to one or two patients. I'm here to tell you it happens to everyone. One of the really tough choices that you have to make is, who do I tell? How much do I share? Should I tell my colleagues at work? And the fact that they were willing to talk to me about that made a huge difference. And the second gift came from my breast surgeon. She did something remarkable. I know in medical school that she was taught to be evasive, that she was taught to be noncommittal, that she was taught to avoid malpractice suits. But you know what? She looked me in the eye and she said, Gail, this is not gonna kill you. Your prognosis is excellent. You are gonna get through this and you are gonna be fine. And I know in some ways she's going out on a limb for telling me that, but I have to tell you, when you hear the words, you have cancer, you are scared out of your wits. You can't even think. And the fact that she calmed me down this way was a gift. It gave me the confidence to go public with my condition, and it made me more capable of healing, which was, was very, very important. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is the fact that I learned a lesson from this too. When you have a big problem, and this is probably pertinent to those of you that are in research, when you have a big problem, there are two ways you can solve it. You can solve it in a silo, or you can solve it by, by collaborating. And I know at work, when, when we have big challenges, one of the most exhilarating feelings is getting diverse thinkers in a room to tackle those problems together. You know, breakthroughs come from that. Cures come from that. Collaboration is where the greatest ideas come from. So I went through breast cancer the first time very much in a silo, and I thought it made me feel strong. But the second time, I invited a lot of people to be on Team Gale. And I have to tell you, when you work with others and forge connections, you're even stronger. Thank you very much.